defending the deal. Labor Secretary Alex Acosta answers questions on his handling of a case involving billionaire Jeffrey Epstein. A role for women. Pope Francis makes a change to an all-male board at the Vatican. We have a report from Rome. Spotting the signs, how the Knights of Columbus is fighting sexual abuse. And a glass house, a look at the new cathedral in the Diocese of Orange in California. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, July 10th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. Labor Secretary Alex Acosta is defending his handling of a sex trafficking case involving Jeffrey Epstein in 2008. He also says he will not resign from his current job. The goal here was straightforward. Put Epstein behind bars, ensured he registered as a sexual offender, provide victims with the means to seek restitution, and protect the public by putting them on notice that a sexual predator was in their midst. Epstein was arrested earlier this week on new charges of sex trafficking. The British ambassador to the U.S. who exchanged insults with President Trump is out of a job. Kim Derrick resigned today after leaked documents revealed his disdain for the president. Trump retaliated on Twitter, calling the ambassador a pompous fool. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Wyatt. It may not be the kind of interaction we're used to seeing among allies, but Kim Derrick's resignation isn't a major surprise. After his remarks became public, President Trump vowed to no longer work with the British ambassador. In his resignation letter today, Ambassador Derrick said, The current situation is making it impossible for me to carry out my role as I would like. Just days before President Trump had tweeted, We will no longer deal with him, following leaked documents, quoting Derrick saying things like this about the Trump administration. We don't really believe this administration is going to become substantially more normal, less dysfunctional, less unpredictable, less faction-riven, less diplomatically clumsy and inept. Today, Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff referring to the resigning ambassador. I think the reality was that in light of, uh, of the last few days, his ability to be effective was probably limited, so it's probably the right course. Following Derek's leaked remarks, the president also tweeted insults, calling Derek the wacky ambassador, a very stupid guy, saying, I don't know the ambassador, but have been told he is a pompous fool. During a televised debate last night, the two contenders to replace British Prime Minister Theresa May also commented on the criticism. She was dragged into a, a British political debate in which in a way he sometimes is. Frontrunner Boris Johnson, sometimes compared to President Trump, refused to back Ambassador Derek. But during a stop at the pub today, Johnson got the notice Derek resigned and shared pints worth of praise. I just, I just heard that uh, Kim Derek resigned and I want to say that I regret that really because I think he was a superb, is a superb diplomat. British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt, Johnson's rival for prime minister, says the ambassador was doing his job by giving a frank assessment of the Trump administration. The U.S. State Department dismisses the spat, saying the United States and the U.K. share a bond that is bigger than any individual. At the White House, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Thanks, Mark. President Trump announces a new plan designed to save lives and money. He's revamping how the government supports kidney dialysis and transplants. We're going to come up with solutions that over a period of five years and ten years, I think most people, even in this room, experts in this room, won't even believe. From what I hear, there are signs and potential out there that's just incredible. The president signed an executive order to encourage better kidney treatment, speed up the transplant process, and make it easier to get dialysis at home. The order is aimed at helping the 30 million Americans who suffer from kidney disease. Some of the initiatives will take time because they require new government regulations. Big Brother or Big Security? The Secret Service, Transportation Security Agency, and other federal agencies are testing facial recognition technology, but some Catholic groups worry it could violate human rights. Correspondent Jason Calvey gives us a look at the debate over the issue in Congress today. The promise of faster lines through airport security. This system will allow us to build a world-class travel system in the U.S. This will be the envy of the world. A computer system that quickly recognizes your face, matches it with your passport. Today, top American security officials talked about how they're testing this technology. In Atlanta, 
the Delta Airlines kiosks use biometric identification to when the passenger checks in mm -hmm. to make sure, should they choose to do so, to make sure that that person is actually the passenger who's ticketed on that particular flight. The computer's ability to ID your face is as close to you as your smartphone. First, I need to unlock it, and then we'll take a selfie, and then swipe up, and it knows it's me. But some Catholics worry about the government using this tech. Catholics in particular are concerned about respect for human dignity and welcoming the immigrant community here. Mary Beth Gallagher leads a Catholic group that signed onto this letter. It urges the Department of Homeland Security to immediately stop using facial recognition technology. It will allow ongoing surveillance uh, without consent of communities and enable um, increased policing that will have a disproportionate impact on communities of color and immigrant communities. And uh, we feel that that is something that should not move forward until we can guarantee the, the rights of the people that are, it's going to be used against. And some lawmakers pointed to when the tech gets the face wrong. Using this technology to help ICE target immigrants for deportation doesn't protect us from terrorism. It terrorizes hardworking families. And at the same time, those products could help police catch criminals. When somebody's in the public domain, as, as I understood in law school, there's no expectation of privacy. Uh, this technology, in my judgment, has uh, really protected the nation. The TSA says it's testing the system at an international terminal in Atlanta. But the city of San Francisco has banned police and other city departments from using this technology. At the Capitol, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thanks, Jason. An appeals court appears to be leaning toward ruling a key part of Obamacare unconstitutional. Two out of the three judges during a hearing seemed skeptical during their questioning of the attorneys defending the law. The Trump administration is hoping the judges will not allow the part of the Affordable Care Act that requires citizens to purchase health insurance. A lawsuit by 18 Republican leading states argues the law is unconstitutional. Homeland Security officials say there has been a 28 percent drop in the number of migrants seen by Border Patrol agents in the past month. The decrease is in part because of a crackdown on refugees by Mexico. The city of Mosul in Iraq remains in ruins two years after the military campaign to take it back from ISIS. One example, an 850-year-old mosque blown up by ISIS fighters as they fled the region. It's still in disrepair. One resident says he's disappointed by the government. A city was a battlefield for intense fighting between Iraqi security forces and the militants. The director of the Sistine Chapel Choir has resigned in wake of a funding scandal. Monsignor Massimo Palombella had been in charge for more than eight years. The Pope has accepted his resignation. Now the 51-year-old is awaiting his next assignment. The Sistine Chapel Choir is believed to be the oldest choir in the world. Pope Francis appointed seven female members this week to a Vatican department. Six women are heads of the religious institutes and one leads a women's secular institute. They're part of the 23 new members of the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life. The appointments break with past practices of an all-male department. Many say it's a result of Pope Francis' call to put women in leadership positions within the Vatican. Joining us now is Céline Tadier, European correspondent for the National Catholic Register. Welcome back to the broadcast, Céline. What message is the Holy Father trying to send by appointing these women? Well, it is the very first time that women are appointed to this congregation that used to be an all-men congregation made of cardinals, bishops, and priests. Uh, it is, um, I mean, the Pope uh, has called many times uh, for a greater space to women within the church authorities. As he said that if the church were to lose women, it could become sterile. So it, is, it looks like it is another sign of uh, the Pope's strategy uh, within the Church over the past few years. And actually, the, um, the, the Roman Cur Curia is uh, currently working on different ways to promote responsibilities for women within the, within the Church. And they are currently working on a reform of the Curia uh, through uh, Councils of Cardinal, and they are discussing these uh, this matters uh, currently. 
So to follow up on that, what is the advantage for the Vatican in promoting more women and putting them in key positions like these? I've been interviewing several women with high responsibilities within the Vatican, and they all told me uh, that they feel that uh, complementarity and otherness are a great strength in dealing with uh, the church affairs. They have the feeling, they are convinced that they can bring a special uh, contribution to the church through their specific sensitivities and experiences. Uh, and they also told me that uh, they, they see the human frailty uh, in, on a different way uh, with respect to men. And so they think they can give a special contribution also in solving many de delicate affairs such as uh, the crisis of sexual abuse. And they also told me that there is a, uh, the, um, the, the, the gift of acceptance uh, is, uh, is a more feminine female value than a, a male value. So they have the feeling that they could, they, they could, uh, they could be very helpful in, uh, in the life of, uh, of the, the employees within the Vatican as they also are good uh, spiritual directors. This is what they told me. Okay, and so then when you think about these women in particular, what stands out to you when you look at the women who have been appointed to this position? Well, when I see them, I see they have different backgrounds and uh, many of them, uh, six of them are running important female congregations. So this specific background and experience uh, could be very, very valuable uh, for the church. And I also see that uh, a lay woman, a consecrated lay woman was appointed which uh, seems to be a sign that the church wants to be more coherent with the fact that since the 1967, the church recognizes the, the, the various forms of uh, consecrated lives. And we've been hearing so much about how the Holy Father wants to include more women in key roles, key leadership positions in the church. So it's interesting to see him carrying that out. So Lynn Taudier, European correspondent for the National Catholic Register. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Coming up, the Knights of Columbus releases a video on the warning signs of sexual abuse. And moviegoers in Canada are reacting to the pro-life film, Unplanned. Welcome back, I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The Knights of Columbus, the world's largest Catholic service organization, releases a video to teach parents how to spot the warning signs of sexual abuse and ways to protect their children. It was so hard to think that someone we loved so dearly and trusted so much would hurt our child. In our society, the video shares the personal story of a Knights of Columbus family whose son was molested by a close family friend. It also includes tips from an expert in sexual abuse prevention. Joining me now by Skype from New Haven, Connecticut, is Carl Anderson, Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus. Welcome back to the broadcast. Uh, this video is part of the Knights Protecting Our Children program. For those who don't know, tell us a little bit about the program and what you wanted to do in putting out this new video. Well, of course, we have 10,000 councils and uh, we have many events for families. So we have Safe Environment Program. Uh, several months ago, my wife and I were meeting with this couple who had had their child abused and it was a brother night and we were just tremendously impressed with the courage of this family how they reacted to this tragedy in their their own life and how they overcame and responded to it and we thought wow this is exactly the kind of message that so many catholic families and even non-catholic families really need they need to know what to look for and then they need to know what to do when they see something. This is exactly what this new documentary video is supposed to help. Parents protect their children. Let me follow up with you on that. What are some of the warning signs that parents should look out for? Well, first of all, they should not have stereotypes as to the type of person that may be the predator or the type of person who cannot be a predator. They should not have stereotypes as to where this uh, behavior occurs. Uh, for example, in a, in a school gym or a school locker room or a parish, this couple, their child was abused in their own home while they were there. And he was abused by their best friend and neighbor. And so it destroyed all the stereotypes. And at the same time, 
uh, the couple was really a very conscientious, dedicated uh, mother and father who spent a lot of time with their children. So uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, of course, anybody who's been involved in parish safe environment programs or the Knights of Columbus safe environment program know what boundaries are, what boundary violations are. And so you've got to be aware. It may not be so obvious if it's your best friend, which was the case in this family. Well, it looks like a boundary violation, but it can't really be because he's our best friend. So we have to be aware, we have to know what to look for, and then whether or not it's even your best friend, you need to put a marker down. I'm teaching my child that this is not really appropriate behavior. And so indicate that. Because one of the things that these predators do, we have to be aware that it's like a predator in the animal world. They don't hunt just an hour a week. They're hunting every day. They're grooming every day. They're looking for a victim every day. And so uh, once we begin to understand how they operate, then we can respond appropriately. I can't even imagine what it's like for those parents and what they've been through, even in being good parents and being so diligent. Uh, what should parents do if they suspect their child has been abused, as you say, if they've been groomed? Well, one of the things that was remarkable in, in learning more about this, and especially their experience, was just a small fraction of children actually report abuse when it's ongoing. And normally it doesn't happen until years later when the abuse has come and gone, if you can say that. Uh, so one of the key one of the key things in, in this family's experience is that, they, as I said, they were committed parents, they were dedicated parents, and they had, in a way, set the groundwork, set the foundation of trust and communication with their children so that when this was actually going on, the child had confidence. Yes, I can talk to my parents. So we hope that this video will help parents protect their children, but also will be an indicator to them as part of our program, The Domestic Church, of strengthening Catholic family life, that the Catholic family is a place like the church, where we can communicate, where we show charity, where we show mercy, where we show forgiveness, where we show understanding. And parents who foster that kind of environment with their children see lay the foundation. So if a tragedy like this happens, they've already gone much farther down the road to a solution. And like we all say, the family is the building block of society, so important. So how, then fam how can families watch this important video? Where can they go? And then what's your plan in terms of distributing it? Well, we're sending it to all of our councils. It's on our website. So if you want to see it, and we, we, we really encourage parents to see it, they can see it at kofc.org, kofc.org. And uh, we hope it'll be available at our councils for members and also through our councils to parish it. Well, so much important information in this video that can really provide a lot of insight to parents and families in general. Carl Anderson, Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus, thanks much for talking with us today. Thank you. And we thank the Knights of Columbus for its support of this program. Movie theaters in Canada are defending their choice to show the pro-life film Unplanned. Two theaters report being threatened after agreeing to screen it. The head of Cineplex says the decision to show the film on just 14 of the company's roughly 1,700 screens was not taken lightly, saying it is up to each individual to decide if they want to see it or not. The film opens Friday in Canada. Archbishop Joseph Kurtz from the Archdiocese of Louisville has been diagnosed with cancer. We've learned he's receiving treatment in his bladder and prostate at Duke University in North Carolina. In a letter to the faithful, the 72-year-old writes in part, quote, Needless to say, I will miss the many opportunities I have to visit parishes and talk with so many of you at upcoming events this summer and fall. You will be in my prayers. Please keep me in yours. Archbishop Kurtz was the president of the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference from 2013 to 2016. Up next, analysis of whether the president will be able to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census. And a diocese in California prepares to unveil its newest cathedral.
Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. A federal judge says the Justice Department cannot replace its legal team handling the dispute on whether to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census without explaining why it's doing so. And President Trump is speaking out. The president tweeted, so now the Obama appointed judge on the census case, are you a citizen of the United States, won't let the Justice Department use the lawyers that it wants to use. Could this be a first? Well, joining me now is Hans von Spakovsky, senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Hans, welcome back to the broadcast. Sure, thanks for having me. What do you make of the DOJ request just to change the legal team that's been handling the census case? I mean, is that in and of itself unusual? Uh, a little bit, but uh, I'm not surprised they did it. Because remember, uh, as soon as the Supreme Court issued its decision, that legal team went back down to the lower court, the, the Supreme Court had remanded the case there, and basically said, well, we're surrendering, we're not going to try to provide you know, more reasons for putting the citizenship question on there. It was clear to me that they hadn't talked to their client, the president, mm -hmm. to see if that's the action he wanted to take, and that was a wrong step for the lawyers handling the case. So I'm not surprised they wanted to put new attorneys on it. Okay. So the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 decision last right. month, said the rationale for adding the citizenship question to the census, enforcing Voting Rights Act, didn't match up with the evidence in your case. What's your take on that? Uh, I think the, the court made a key mistake here. Um, the, the Chief Justice joined with the four liberal justices to say that the rationale was not sufficient. But this was after the, the uh, Chief Justice, uh, along with the conservatives, found that it's both constitutional to have a citizenship question and that the Commerce Secretary had the legal authority to do it. That should have ended the case right there. Uh, it, it's very unusual for them to try to say that the rational reason, and it is a rational reason, I used to enforce the Voting Rights Act at the Justice Department, this data is needed to enforce it. Uh, that was not a good decision by the Chief Justice. I think he made a crucial mistake. Okay, well, we don't yet know the details, but earlier this week, Attorney General William Barr right. said he does see a way legally to require the census response to declare whether or not they're citizens, despite the Supreme Court ruling. So what do you think's next? Uh, he didn't give any details on how they're going to do it. I suspect they probably are looking at the president potentially signing an executive order to do this. The reason that uh, might be the way to do it is that uh, the Supreme Court was reviewing the rationale given by the Commerce Secretary under a federal statute called the Administrative Procedure Act. The APA does not apply to the president. So that, that would short circuit, I think, uh, the court's review of that. It doesn't mean a lower court might still not try to issue an injunction against the president, but I think this is a way of getting that done. Okay, we'll be following this to see what results as, as uh, all this continues to sort of play out. Hans von Spakovsky, Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, thanks so much. Sure, thanks for having me. Finally tonight, the Diocese of Orange in California is set to introduce a long-awaited and much larger place to gather and pray. Much, much larger. Christ Cathedral is 88,000 square feet and features nearly 11,000 glass panes. The rector says he hopes, quote, through the beauty of this place, people will be drawn closer to the divine. The cathedral once housed a booming evan televangelist ministry. Converting it cost $77 million. The Diocese of Orange is home to more than one million faithful. EWTN also has a studio on the campus of the cathedral. EWTN will air the dedication live at 1.30 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, July 17th, next week. A special preview show will air just before that at 1 o'clock. Visit EWTN.com for the full programming schedule. And credit to everyone who has been working on the cathedral's renovation. That facility certainly looks like it has come a long way. And that concludes our newscast for tonight. We thank you for watching. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.